All right, welcome to the John David Ebert School for the Study of Culture, Cosmology, and the Arts. Uh, now we are moving on in this course uh, to a discussion of the work of the great German philosopher Jean Gebser. Um, he was born Hans Gebser, actually, in Posen. Here's his Wikipedia page. Posen as it was then in the German Empire. Uh, and he left and went to school in Königsberg, the city where Immanuel Kant had, uh, had, had dwelt. And then um, after his experience with the Nazis, the brown shirts, uh, he ran into them in 1931. He left Germany and went to Spain where he learned the Spanish language and became an official in the Ministry of Education there. Um, he left that uh, his apartment in 1936, just 12 hours before it was bombed, uh, and eventually wound up in Paris for a while where he hung out with Picasso and the avant-garde there in Paris. Uh, he had known personally in Spain uh, Garcia Lorca and then uh, moved on eventually to the Jungian world in Switzerland uh, where he gave some talks at the the Jungian uh, world down there at uh, Bolingen, um, that whole world. All right, so we have this one book that has been translated. Nothing else really has been translated. Uh, a couple of other minor things. Uh, this one book, which came out in two volumes, the idea for it occurred to him in 1932. Uh, so he'd had the idea in his mind, and it began to become more firm in 1936. And then um, when he moved to Switzerland, uh, he started really working on it. Uh, it, it t basically took him 10 years, more or less, uh, and published the first volume in 1949, and the second volume, I believe, I think it was 1951. And so the first volume is called Part One, Foundations of the Aperspectival World, a Contribution to the History of the Awakening of Consciousness. Note this, because a lot of New Agers and, and people of this sort present Gebser as talking about the evolution of consciousness. That's not what this book is about. Because evolution implies that each of the five consciousness structures, um, each one that comes after the one before it, is an improvement and is better than the previous consciousness structure. Gebser doesn't want to convey that at all. They're different. They're simply structurally, they're mutations for one thing. They have no cause. They, uh, they just happen uh, to cultures in particular times and places. And... Um, it's an awakening of consciousness, the model here. There's a gradual turning of consciousness from, you might say in the Upanishads, deep dreamless sleep. Um, that's sort of like the magical consciousness structure and then moving into the dreaming structure of the mythical consciousness, which always has to do with images. Myths have to do with images, uh, which is why movies in a way uh, are pop culture. Gebser didn't care for pop culture, I don't take it. Uh, but our movies are uh, a reactivation and miniaturization of the mythical consciousness structure. That's what they are. And then uh, the mental consciousness structure. Uh, the human psyche begins to become more aware and awake of the world through the evolution of these consciousness structures from the archaic. And the archaic is the, the ground. It is the ever-present origin because the archaic consciousness is always present. All of these structures are. Once they come into being, they... Uh, when they become exhausted or flip into a deficient mode and they begin to disintegrate, then uh, uh, once that happens, the disintegration process is a very slow, gradual process that takes place uh, through uh, uh, epochs of history slowly as the new consciousness comes in uh, with a certain degree of incipiency. There's a kind of overlap of the consciousness structures, but the previous ones don't ever disappear. They just... Uh, he wouldn't use this Jungian term because he's, he's kind of um, being a, young, a rebel against Jung here, I, I think, in a way. Um, so if, as far as he's thought of Jung's model of the collective unconscious, it's not organized. It's just for Jung. It's just this kind of midden heap composed of the signifiers of the archetypes. Uh, this midden heap that contains all the world's religions and the signifiers from all the world's myths. Gebser sees it in a much more structured way that these the collective unconscious is made up out of these consciousness structures like strata, like geological strata. The earlier strata don't go away. They, they stay there and they can be activated uh, at any time. And so in a way, this book, as I mentioned before, is a kind of synthesis of Jung with Spangler. He's read and studied them both and finds that both of them have limitations and so as far as he's concerned, the integral consciousness, which he also calls a perspectival, uh, 
Those terms can be used interchangeably. The aperspectival integral consciousness structure that came into being in the last couple of decades of the 19th century um, announces a whole new structure of consciousness that relativizes the previous four structures. Uh, so they're all still there and they're integrated into one single consciousness structure. So this is a different view from Spangler because Spangler in the decline of the West sees the West disintegrating at the exact moment uh, in the middle of the 19th century, second half of it, that Gebser sees a new consciousness structure coming into being. Gebser looked, looks at this development with optimism, Spengler with pessimism, because for Spengler, what he's really writing about is the decline of the perspectival consciousness structure, the rational mental pers and the perspectival phase, which is the second half of that consciousness structure. Um, it disintegrates. And um, so what the, as we'll see here, I want to illustrate this in a concrete way with the images that he talks about. It will make the text very concrete. The perspectival uh, structure, when it comes into being, dices up the world into pieces, into quadrants and sectors, and what McLuhan would call points of view with uh, perspectival, especially with the mastery in the 15th century of depth perspective and painting, the world is being carved into slices, that uh, every slice has its own point of view. What will happen with uh, the integral consciousness structure, as it as the word says, integral, it will synthesize. Whereas the perspectival consciousness analyzes, 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 analyzes space down into its component parts, the task of the integral consciousness structure will be to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. It's a synthetic process. Um, okay, so let's look at these first two chapters just for this class. We have his fundamental considerations here. Um, and I read... I think maybe for the first time, the prefaces, uh, not, not his prefaces, but the, uh, the prefatory matter from the other contributors and editors, I usually don't find it very illuminating, but I did notice that the title, The Ever-Present Origin, was translated by Gebser himself because he could read English. And he had intended on translating this book. And um, there are some of his translations are, uh, are included in the book. The chapter on the magical structure, which we'll look at next time, is translated by him and then something else. So there's some of his actual, uh, his own translation in, in here. Um, he died in 1973 uh, at the age of 67. And so he t starts with these fundamental considerations um, where he's talking about how, uh, two points, a mere interpretation of our times is inadequate. We don't just need some cultural critic to come along and give us an interpretation. We must furnish concrete evidence of phenomena that are clearly revealed as being new and that transform not only our countenance, but the very countenance of time, it's time itself. Uh, because just as the perspectival structure of consciousness is all about the discovery of space, three-dimensional depth pers perspectival space, and along with that then, the subject that is viewing that object and the rise of the strong ego and the rise of the sense of individuality comes into being. So with the integral consciousness structure, we will be discovering time and incorporating time. Two, the condition of today's world cannot be transformed by technocratic rationality. Since that's the deficient mode of consciousness, the mental consciousness structure, um, mental rational, and the second phase of it is depth perspectival, uh, that's the Faustian phase of it, let's say, uh, in contradistinction to the Greek or Roman, though he doesn't use ever use Spengler's terminology. Um, that's technocratic rationality. The integral is irrational. It is not irrational. Uh, the unperspectival, as we'll see, is, is the irrational. Um, then the rational perspectival. This consciousness structure is not a regression uh, back to magic and mysticism. It's, it's beyond that. It's much more sophisticated than that. Since both technocracy and rationality are apparently nearing their apex, nor can it be transcended by preaching or admonishing a return to ethics and morality, or in fact, by any form of return to the past. Okay, so this is not a return to the past. Consciousness is moving forward into new phases. Um, so that's the point of the fundamental considerations. And now, what I want to do is look at the second chapter with illustrations, because... I think the illustrations will make uh, his points very concrete. 
let's start back here with the uh, the megalithic as he does. So he's talking about the three European worlds, and first he starts off by talking about the unperspectival world. So we have, um, before he gets into the, the consciousness structures proper, which he'll get into in the next chapter, which is a much longer chapter that we'll get into next week, he starts off uh, narrowing his thesis, just making it th these three different European worlds. The unperspectival world, uh, then in that for Europe starts here with the megaliths, six, roughly 6,000 BC, Stonehenge is uh, like 3,000 BC, and um, goes all the way down to the 5th century, whereupon we get five centuries of the perspectival world, and then just now within the last century we have the aperspectival world. So those are the three European worlds. So the unperspectival world includes uh, all the previous consciousness structures uh, before depth perspective is, is developed in the 15th century. But he starts off by saying that space in the unperspectival world um, is not is not distinct. And he, he says here, the first dolmen architecture, and this is what we're looking at here, uh, entered the Mediterranean region primarily from northern and western Europe and was especially influential on Greek architecture. It is phallic. And so that's the key thing to note about this it is phallic in nature and survives in the column architecture later on in the column architecture of uh, in Greece. Um, as in the Parthenon, space is visible here simply as diastyle or the intercolumnar space. Space is simply the, the spaces between the columns for the Greeks, whose structure is determined by the vertical posts and the horizontal lintels and corresponds to Euclidean cubic space. And so we have those... The, the, the trilithons, from the trilithons of Stonehenge all the way down to those uh, columns in Greek temples, uh, this is the, the prototype for it here, uh, where you have a, a lintel going across in, with two uprights. Now this form of architecture um, is part of the culture that Oswald Spengler terms in his last book, um, the, uh, he, he considers it to be amoebic, and he, he calls it the Atlantic uh, peoples, or he, he actually uses the word Atlantis, but I prefer to to change it to Atlantic because it, it confuses with the myth of Atlantis. And he's not talking about that. And these are tomb builders. Uh, the main emphasis, as in New Grange, which comes in in Ireland, thirty five hundred BC, they're they're building these womb tomb things. Uh, but they're, the emphasis is also very phallic with the, uh, and even here, if, as we look at this model. It's, it's the act of erecting one of them is tumescent, like a, like an erection. Um, the whole thing is tumescent. Um, okay, so that's uh, that culture. And then the, what Spengler means by the Kosh culture, and these come in around 6000 BC, the one in the West, uh, here's a map for it. These are all the, the megaliths uh, coming in here. Uh, this is his Atlantic amoeba, which will then uh, drift across North Africa into Corsica and Sardinia, uh, into Sicily, and eventually make it to, to Egypt. But then when it meets the other amoeba that comes from the other direction from India, it'll come from Neolithic India and uh, Iran, Persia, and uh, also uh, Saudi Arabia in the, in the south part of it here. Here's a, a charismatic example of it at Hegra, an ancient city in Saudi Arabia, and uh, the, these are not megalithic, they're uteromorphic. They're building wombs here. They're tunneling caves into mountains, um, doing the very opposite of Spengler's uh, Atlantic culture with its phallic emphasis. And this is what corresponds exactly to the next paragraph. The second structural element uh, is the uterine character of grotto architecture that entered the Mediterranean area from the Orient from the Orient, just like Spengler's Kosh amoeba, mainly from Iran, but also India, and survives in Roman dome architecture as in the uh, Pantheon or the baths. So the Pantheon is a very late echo, even though Spengler says it's from Magian civilization, Judeo-Christian Islamic civilization, it's the first mosque because their civilization is fundamentally cavernous in character. But that uh, originates here from the Kosh culture and it travels up the Persian Gulf uh, and into the Middle East, and where the Kosh culture meets the uh, 
Atlantic amoeba, the two cross and we get the first generation of civilization. So it, it, it's very much like a sacred marriage between the phallus and, and the uterine culture, and it produces uh, Egypt and Sumer. He changes the metaphor here, uh, though, in a moment. So here, space is merely a vault, a grotto space, corresponding to the powerful cosmological conception of the oriental matriarchal religions for which the world itself is nothing but a vast cavern. So in a way, he's doing a kind of archaeology here, a cultural archaeology on Spengler's Magian Cavern. Uh, this is where it came from. It is of interest that Plato, in his famous allegory, was the first to describe man in the process of leaving the cave. Isn't that interesting? Uh, because it's with by the time of the Greeks we have, they're still unperspectable, spatially considered. Um, but in terms of the mutation of consciousness there, it's the mental coming in with the Greeks, and so it's time to leave uh, the uteromorphic protection of the cavern. And so he says they're, they're amalgamation then of these two uh, cultures, uh, or s feelings for space, rather. Um, subsequently gives rise to the Son of Man, as though Christ were their uh, offspring. The duality of the column and tower, on the one hand, the vault and dome, on the other, of Christian church architecture made feasible for the first time the trinity represented by the Son as man, the man who will create his own space. And he says that it's interesting that in, it is in precisely the time of Christ that we get the uh, styles here from Pompeii, where there is the earliest incipient beginnings of perspectivity. Uh, he doesn't think it's a coincidence that this begins in the time of Christ, this is how it starts, where it's a trompe l'oeil imitation uh, of, of lintels and, and so forth. Then we have the invention of the still life there. There is already definitely a sense of perspective. Those doors look like they're opening. You, you can really feel them opening. They're almost perspectively correct. Um, and so this is what he's talking about when he's talking about the Pompeii art and the, and the sense of uh, you have rooms up here that have a certain degree of depth to them. This is pretty amazing stuff. It's pretty wonderful that he figured this out. All right, and then, uh, so then now, so moving on into the perspectival world. So that's all part of the unperspectival world, everything all the way up to the Renaissance in the West. And so the West then has the task of, and this really is consistent with Spengler's Ur symbol for the West as the Faustian, uh, the Faustian desire for infinite space. It's pretty consistent with what he's saying here as we go through this. So with the Siena masters around the time of uh, the late 13th century, so 1255 here, we have one of them, uh, Duccio. Notice that they inherit, so they inherit the, the Byzantine iconotypes of the Last Supper and uh, the beheading of John the Baptist and, and so forth. And here's Christ talking to uh, Peter and Andrew. So note that even when they paint outdoor scenes, there's always the gold background left over from the cave world, the Magian cavern world within which everything is enclosed. Um, it's, it's always there. There is no real sense for space. Uh, space is basically flat. It looks flat. Even the, when they try to represent it in a perspectival way, it, lo it looks flat. But then when uh, we move with uh, into the world of Giotto, slightly later, a couple of decades later, um, he's the one who really begins to get rid of the, the cave. He gets rid of the gold background and starts to paint a blue sky in. Uh, absolutely amazing. There's a sense for an awakening now, the blue sky there again, of the outer world. Uh, the Faustian consciousness is awakening and discovering infinite space slowly here. First by getting rid of the cavern world, uh, the Magian pseudomorphosis, to use a Spenglerian term, and then uh, breaking it up into, uh, open it up to the outer, the outer world. It's a slow, gradual process. And here we have uh, the Lorenzetti brothers. This is Pietro Lorenzetti. And he mentions them in the text, which I think is uh, an absolutely, exquisitely beautiful painter. But Gebser says, notice that when, he, when Lorenzetti paints a moon, it's no longer an astral symbolic moon. He's trying to paint a real moon there in that sky. And he even throws a little shooting star in there. Um, so the this, this spatial conception is awakening as we move along here. Let's see, where are we at? So now at, at the same time, this is Mount uh, Ventoux in France. At the same time that this is going on, he says Petrarch is ascending Mount Ventoux and he experiences infinite space almost as a revelation. 
And for Gebser, it matters that he's standing up above a mountain overlooking land, not overlooking sea, as in some of the previous accounts of Hadrian's ascent. Uh, I think up Mount Etna. There was a couple of others. Um, the sea is a symbol for the soul. So it's not, if you're standing on the mountain overlooking the sea, you're still immersed in the mythical consciousness structure where the water is always uh, what he'll call later the, the soul's life pole. Um, it's, a, it's important that Petra, Petrarch is the first to ascend this mountain in about the year, what is it, 1330, I think. And he writes a letter. He um, goes to the trouble of writing a letter in the style of Augustine's confessions as though he was making a confession, as though he had, he had committed a sin somehow. And his, a quote from his letter here, to, he writes to, a, I think it's a bishop or a cardinal, Um, it is addressed to the Augustinian professor of theology who had taught him to emulate Augustine's confessions. Um, so he writes, Shaken by the unaccustomed wind and the wide, freely shifting vistas, I was immediately awestruck. I look, the clouds lay beneath my feet. I look toward Italy, whither turned my soul, even more than my gaze and sigh at the sight of the Italian sky, which appeared more to my spirit than to my eyes, and I was overcome by an inexpressible longing to return home. Suddenly, a new thought seized me, transporting me from space into time. I said to myself, it has been ten years since you left Bologna. In lines that follow, recollecting a decade of suffering and preoccupied by the overpowering desire for his homeland that befell him during the unaccustomed sojourn on the summit, he reveals that his thoughts have turned inward. Still marked by his encounter with what was then a new reality, yet shaken by its effect, he flees from space back into time out of the first experience with space, back to the gold ground of the Siena Masters. Isn't that beautiful? Wonderful stuff there. Um, and this is, of course, fr from this all the way down to Caspar David Friedrich's painting of the wanderer standing in a sea of fog at the top of a mountain. Uh, this is where it happens. This is the prototype for that painting, this whole experience. So note, too, that what's going on here, um, McLuhan would come along and say there's a cause here somewhere. The cause was the printing press. The printing press comes into being, I don't know, writing around, right around 14, 1439 or so, but <clears throat> it's not the cause. McLuhan has a shallow uh, materialistic ontology in which he views everything as cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect. There are no causes here, uh, nor does Gebser ever bother to explain them. That's the German idealistic philosophical tradition that he has inherited from Goethe at work here. There's no causes. We're just finding what the mutations are. This is a mysterious mutation of consciousness that takes place because depth perspective was already up and running with Masaccio. Um, we'll look at him here. Let's see, before we get to Masaccio, to have a glance at Ucello. Uh, in the background, you can see the, this is 1470. Uh, the background, the sense of space is really coming in to focus more and more. The outer world is depicted with ever greater and greater realism as we go along here especially in uh, this book, The Very Rich Hours of the Duke of Berry, uh, we get a very lush, uh, it's still an illuminated manuscript style, uh, but a very lush outer world that's coming into being here, a real feeling for space. And then so, but with Masaccio, I think we get the first uh, technical mastery of depth perspective, such as here with the tribute money. Um, let's see if we can bring that in. Yeah, look at this. Word. We are out now in space. The gold ground is gone. We are, the cavern is gone. The Magian pseudomorphosis has been outgrown as a new uh, mutation comes in here. Now, this is still within the mental consciousness structure inaugurated with the Greeks. We're still in that phase, just in a second phase of it, in which space is no longer unperspectival, but a new civilization has come along with a feeling for infinite space, I would say, though he avoids Spenglerian language. And uh, there's another mutation still within the mental, but now perspectival. Three-dimensional depth perspective is now uh, being mastered. And Masaccio uh, is doing most of his painting before the printing press. Um, so it's not, it's not from the printing press that, that this is happening. And moreover, it's happening simultaneously in all the different disciplines in the arts. Um, by the time we get to Leonardo, let's say, what do we have here? Oh, we also have, too, it's important to note that with that sense of depth perspective in painting, we also get the mastery of the portrait study, which is a sort of confession. 
uh, in, in art of the sense of one's soul as a metaphysical entity unto oneself. And we get now single particular individuals being represented, not types, not iconotypes. Abak Durar paints himself using the iconotype of, of the Christ, the all-seeing gaze of Christ's portrait, only he plugs himself into that iconotype now. That comes into being with the mastery of depth perspective because you have two vertices, as Leonardo figured out. You have uh, the, vert the vertex of the vanishing point all the way at the end of the horizon there. Uh, but you also have the fact that there's a, a vertex in the subject's eyeball as well that's doing the seeing because these light ray, the eye is passively receiving these light rays rays that, that come to a cone to a vertex in the subject. So you get an absolute subject, metaphysically speaking here now, an absolute subject with an absolute object. And this will become Heidegger's for Handenheit later on when we do Heidegger. And so here we have uh, Leonardo has, a, has got it mastered perfectly. Uh, this is the first Annunciation to Mary painting that's done mainly out uh, in the outdoors. Uh, hitherto, she had always only been represented indoors. And then the mastery of aerial perspective uh, here, which isn't just including a vanishing point. Notice that Christ is painted in the shape of an equilateral triangle. And Judas over here is a scalene triangle. So he's off center. And the, the vanishing point terminates right above Christ's head there. Coterminous note with the landscape behind it. And it's perfectly, beautifully, geometrically organized into groups. The apostles are all in groups of three over here. And only you only know this is Judas uh, because of his reaction, his, his facial pullback. Um, everyone else is saying, Master, is it I that will betray you? Who's, who's so in the chromatic, the color gradations, um, he's mastering depth perspective with the color gradations as well, not just the vanishing point. And here's the, the, the ultimate climax of it, as far as I'm concerned. It's the Mona Lisa, and the point of the Mona Lisa is that we have here the portrait study combined with the vanishing point in the background. He achieves both in one painting. Spectacular. Uh, that's just a maestro. Okay, so then uh, um, Manet will come and break this apart. Uh, let me see if there's any other points. Uh, so the other point, too, about this all happening... And he has this sentence here that sounds just like something McLuhan would have said. He says, Perspectiva perspectivation, let us remember, also includes a reduction. And this reductive nature is evident, for instance, in perspectival man's predominantly visual or sight orientation in contrast to unperspectival man's audio or hearing orientation. That uh, might as well be a sentence taken straight out of uh, understanding media. Um, the West trades an eye for an ear uh, with the Gutenbergian galaxy, which is what this is, although it's not caused by the printing press, as McLuhan thinks that it was. It simply was not. It's far more mysterious than that. Um, and then as he says here, too, uh, this could just as well be a, a sentence describing this painting right here. The emergent awareness of distantiating space presupposes a clear vision and this heightening of awareness is accompanied by an increase of personal or ego consciousness. That's the Mona Lisa in words. Bam. Um, awesome stuff. Okay, and then, uh, so he, he points out that, so nothing's causing anything here because this is, all these cultural phenomena are manifestations of a single cultural zeitgeist, let's say. Copernicus, for example, shatters the limits of the geocentric sky. This is the same time as Leonardo, uh, and discovers heliocentric space. Columbus goes beyond the encompassing Oceanos and discovers Earth space. Vesalius, the first major anatomist, bursts the confines of Galen's ancient doctrines of the human body and discovers the body space. Harvey destroys the precepts of Hippocrates' humoral medicine and reveals the circulatory system. And there is Kepler, who by demonstrating the elliptical orbit of the planets, overthrows antiquity's unperspectival world image of circular and flat surfaces, a view still held by Copernicus, that dated back to Ptolemy's conception of the circular movements of the planets. Right. Uh, and so, nothing is, you can't say one thing is causing another here. All of this stuff is happening simultaneously with the birth of a new civilization and its feeling for infinite space. Um, you know, I like how he says here, too, that um, in mundane endeavors this was happening. It was around this time that lace was first introduced and here we see that even the fabric could no longer serve merely as a surface, but had to be broken open, as it were, 
to reveal the visibility of the background or substratum. Nor is it accidental that in those years of the discovery of space via perspective, the incursions into the various spatial worlds mentioned above brought on with finality a transformation of the world into a spatial, that is, a sectored world, with maps and charts and grids and latitude and longitude, carving it up. The previous unity breaks apart. This is the fall of Humpty Dumpty off the wall here. Not only is the world segmented and fragmented, but the age of colonialism and the other divisions begins. Schisms and splits in the church, conquests and power politics, unbounded technology and all types of emancipations, schisms within schisms within schisms as the perspectival consciousness structure carves the world apart into pieces and analyzes it. Right, so then that sets us up for the aperspectival world which comes in here in the latter uh, part of the 19th century which uh, starts really with Edward Manet um, who is an artist that Spangler has nothing good to say about um, the uh, the music in the Tuileries, 1862 is already beginning to break... uh, proper depth perspective apart. Uh, There's something spatially not right about it. And that's deliberate because when we get to this thing here, the luncheon on the grass, 1863, if this woman back here were perspectively correct, she would be a nine foot tall giant. So she's existing in her own space over here in a space that's disconnected from the space that these three are sitting in here. And even over here, this kind of looks flat. This looks like it's also in its own space. So all three of these arranged into a pyramid with three different planes, each receding into its own space. Uh, it's fascinating how he does this. Let's see if they have his uh, painting, a, a boating on here. Um, some really beautiful stuff. It's too bad Spangler didn't like it, but uh, okay, let's see. And then what else? We have also Cezanne uh, is another one who begins to really break space up and puts it, he starts painting on, actually on a curved surface. After he gets going here, we got to get down to where he starts breaking it all apart and two-dimensionalizing it. Really right here, as Leonard Schlein points out in Art and Physics, actually, um, he shows the different perspectives that are that are going on here. This is no longer perspectival, which is an irony since we already saw the invention of the still life in Pompeii as an incipient example of perspectivism. Here we have its disintegration. Um, it almost looks like the the... The bulls could just slide off the surface as though they were tilting. Uh, so the space is breaking apart here. And that's what the Impressionists are doing in both the first generation with Manet, Monet, Renoir, and the second generation with uh, Cezanne and Van Gogh. They're flattening space out, pulling it apart. And now, um, so with Picasso, which which uh, for Gebser is, is the paradigm case uh, for the integral consciousness structure, Picasso will then begin putting Humpty Dumpty back together. And so we'll have, starting here with the aperspectival consciousness structure, um, and this is heavily influenced by uh, um, Cezanne, one one of his paintings about bathers. Um, They're flat. They've got African tribal masks. They look like cardboard cutouts. They have no depth to them whatsoever. Um, And the real thing, though, is with cubism, the idea of multiple spaces, multiple temporalities, multiple spaces are being taken up and integrated, integral, and made whole. So time now is being discovered because it's being integrated. In the time that it would take me to walk around this woman playing a mandolin, that takes time, but the time is put in here by putting all the different angles uh, that we would look at her through time as simultaneous, as co-present with space. Einstein is doing the same thing when he takes time, puts it together with space and calls it the space-time four-dimensional continuum. Uh, that's the first time time gets integrated into uh, into physics. So here again, it's happening all through the arts and sciences and the humanities, uh, this new mutation of consciousness that Spangler saw as a decay. Indeed, almost all the Germans, except for Gebser, the great German thinkers, saw it as a decay. Uh, Young, Heidegger, uh, Rudolf Steiner, every one of them saw it as, as just degenerate. Uh, and the Nazis called it degenerate art. It's not degenerate. They're, they, they're not understanding the new consciousness structure that is emerging here, uh, which we will spend the rest of this course discussing uh, in exquisite detail. Uh, Gebser said, this is one of my favorites, uh, Guernica. He says that this is an almost complete abolition of space altogether. And it's inside of a cave, uh, a kind of cavern uh, 
lit by a, an electric eye that has superseded the candle of the three muses over here from the mythical epic. Uh, Don Quixote has fallen from his stallion here. The age of the lone ego protagonist Hamlet Lear Quixote figure is at an end now. Uh, here's the old dying and reviving mother with the chopped up Isis with the chopped up pieces of Osiris here, the dying and reviving moon bull god. Um, that's all being superseded now by the flattening out of space and um, the integrality of, of making time uh, co-present along with it. Um, okay, so that's our, our setup here. Uh, I'm endlessly fascinated with Picasso. He, he really is a, a maestro. Okay, uh, we'll discuss this in class.